Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. The night is past, and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off all the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and impurities, not in contention and envy. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Words taken from the lesson for this first Sunday of Advent. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The year is 1519. The date, Good Friday. We are in the company of Hernan Cortez, coming on to Mexico's shore at a port newly named Veracruz, the True Cross. The banner leading the way reads, Brothers and Companions, let us follow the sign of the cross with true faith, and in it we shall conquer. In this model, we hear an echo of Moses entering Egypt with a alone, by the way, Moses entering Egypt alone with only a wooden staff. And we hear once again the word seen in the heavens by Constantine so long ago, in hulk signo vinces. In this sign you shall conquer. Upon this sign Israel was freed from Pharaoh's grip. Upon this sign Christendom was founded and Christendom spread. And upon this sign, Christendom will return and the Antichrist will be slain. Without this sign, we will fail without doubt. Two expeditions have preceded us into Mexico in the years 1517 and 1518, both of which failed. But they were not led by Cortez who was a good man, no matter how much modern writers try to vilify him. He unified his men and even drew various tribes of Indians to join him. There was no Hebrew against Hebrew, as happened when Moses tried to do things his own way in Egypt. He didn't do it God's way. Everyone has their faults and weaknesses, with even Moses, the meekest of men, Moses, the meekest of men, being prevented from entering the promised land due to one of his shortcomings. But Cortez wore an image of Our Lady holding his majesty around his neck. He prayed the divine office every morning. He gave alms regularly, and he heard mass with great devotion. He had for his protectors the patrons and patrons, the Virgin Mary, Saints Peter and Paul, St. James, and St. John the Baptist. He did not swear using foul words. Instead, he'd say, on my conscience, or when angry, simply saying, may you live to rue it. He was known to be long-suffering and patient, always a sign of a saintly soul. We, on our side, only have 11 ships offshore. Some 500 men with 16 horses, kind of rare in the New World, 32 crossbows, 13 muskets, four small cannons, and a few large bronze cannons. Not much compared to the highly organized Aztec empire, so dark and so cruel, populated by some 15 million people. If we consider that at least 20% of those people are strong men capable de of defending their realm, the odds against us are about 10,000 to 1. Hmm. It does not take long for Cortez and company to realize what we face. Human sacrifice is all around us. When the ambassadors of Montezuma the Aztec Antichrist tyrant arrived, they think Cortez fits the description of a prophecy of Quetzalcoatl, leading them to ruthlessly sacrifice a number of captive Indians before us 
in a span of just 15 seconds each. So skilled are they in killing and dismembering the victims that no one can stop the slaughter before it is too late. We see clearly what we're up against. Later on, we pass through the places where human skulls are on display in the city squares. In one city alone, we count, we see the hollowed out eyes of about a hundred thousand skulls staring back at us. Wonderful place. The fearful ambassadors tried to prevent Cortez from advancing to Mexico City, offering him presents as well as employing magical spells and curses and even using a sort of voodoo-like double of Cortez. All of these efforts fell, doubtlessly aided by the protection of the sacraments and sacramentals Cortez uses so devoutly. After some months of establishing a fort and sending back a ship with news and requests, the time of decision has arrived. We still have the ships. They're still sitting in harbor. Cortez burns them all except one. He says, we already understand the expedition we are to make. And with the help of our Lord Jesus Christ, we must win all our battles and encounters. If we are ever defeated, which God forbid, we can never raise our heads again. For there are so few of us that we can expect no other help but his. Now that we no longer have ships in which to return to Cuba, we must depend upon our stout hearts and our strong blows. Like Gideon, like Gideon of old, Cortez offers passage back to Cuba for those unwilling to join him. There was one ship left. No one took him up on the offer. No one abandons the cause and the last ship is burned. We face a similar battle even now. Demons are innumerable, and those cooperating them with them are legion. The times are evil. The Antichrist figures abound. The claws of the devil dragon are tearing away at the fabric of all that is true, that is good and beautiful. For those with stout hearts, who are willing to use the armor provided by heaven, there is no turning back. The ships to worldly shores must be burned. It's better to burn now than burn later. Our baptismal vows demand it. Our confirmation graces enable it. Fear not, faithful soldier of Christ, fear not. We have what it takes to withhold the power of Antichrist and deflect the dull claws of Satan. We have it. We have the cross, the means to bring about the order in our camp and disorder and destruction in the camp of the enemy. Two arms, two arms, cries St. Teresa of Jesus I say to all of you who are fighting under the standard of the cross, do not sleep, do not sleep. There is no peace on earth, she says. And since like a mighty captain our God willed to die, let us follow him. Do not sleep, do not sleep. Oh, what blessed warfare. Let no one desert. Let us risk our life, she says. For he who will lose his life will find it best. Thank you, St. Teresa. What is to be done? St. Benedict tells us, he's one of the founders of Europe. St. Benedict tells us in his rule, not to make a false peace. No. St. Teresa agrees in her meditation on the Song of Songs, stating, God deliver you from the peace of many kinds of that worldly people have. May he never allow us to try that peace, for it brings perpetual war. This kind of peace brings perpetual war. When such persons of the world remain quiet while going about in serious sin, 
and so tranquil about their vices, for their consciences don't feel remorseful. Their peace is a sign that they and the devil are friends. While they live, the devil does not wage war against them. She then explains that if the devil did attack them more openly, they might flee to God in his armory, the Holy Catholic Church. We're going to talk about that this week. They're going to, they would flee there for refuge, not out of love, out of fear, just to escape the attacks. Then she adds, those who would act in such a way would never persevere in serving God. Soon, since the devil understands this, he would again give them delight in their, in their pleasures, and they would return to their friendship with him until he has them in that place, hell downstairs, where he shows them how false their peace was. Hmm. Is that not why we are here today? We have lived through the repeated fruitless efforts of modern churchmen and state leaders trying to make a false peace. We are bracing for more of the same. We have awakened with many of us bearing deep wounds from this misguided effort. With this awakening, we realize there's no use in running for, as this war has been raging from time immemorial. From the first day of creation even, and it's pounding away at our very doors. Nay, it is inside. You cannot get away from it. His majesty tells us the devils fell like lightning from heaven. St. John tells us the devil was cast out onto the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. St. Paul says, for our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the world of this darkness, against the spirits of wickedness in the high places. Thus, Job tells us, the life of man upon earth is a warfare. And this means that we are in a spiritual conflict until death. Even unto the end of the world, well then, spiritual battles require spiritual armor, spiritual weapons. And that's what this mission is about. When a leader goes on ahead, if he's a good leader, he does at least two things. He leaves behind what is needed for those following him to stay the course. And he leaves markers highlighting the path so that they do not get lost or take the wrong turn, ensuring they will be reunited soon. His Majesty, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, King of Kings, did both of these things as he went on ahead of us, ascending body and soul into heaven above. Were not his last words a promise of this very thing? Behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. Unsurprisingly, all of his markers are in the shape of the cross, clearly clearly showing us the way. In this mission, we're going to examine as much as time permits and my weak human nature allows what armor His Majesty left us as He rose up into the heaven of heavens, leading the way home. We will consider clothing like helmets, breastplates, belts, badges, footgear, as well as weapons to defend and protect ourselves, such as swords, spears, and shields. We will meet the greatest of his generals, St. Michael the Archangel, and end with Our Lady of Victories, she who crushes the devil's head. Come and learn about this armor and the divine armory that generously provides it for us. Obstacles thwarting its proper use, such as the serpent's scaling ladders, what are those? Will be exposed and dismantled. Along with the model D weaponry he relies on so heavily, the devil's got a weaponry. It's a model D weaponry. Got a catalog. We'll talk about his catalog. To effectively disarm the devil, we will need to visit the war room and fully embrace the strategy and plans sponsored by heaven. Last time we talked about practicing for heaven. Now we're about the church militant. 
Let us never doubt that his majesty, the perfect king of kings, has indeed provided all our needs. Each and every one, even unto the end of time, God will never abandon us. It's always been available. We don't need something new. It's already here. He will always fortify us with his holy armor. Relying on these great gifts, his promises, his arms and armory, hope will arise anew. That's why I'm here. I want hope to rise in your hearts anew. Enabling us to follow the difficult path he has embarked and earmarked for us. No matter how painful, how dark, how strange the times. He has provided everything that is needed. How could he not? He is the perfect leader. He is the savior. Now to avoid becoming a casualty then, we need to employ all the arms he provides. Now, how many people do we know who have fallen away, who don't think actions have consequences, who no longer believe in heaven, in hell, or even God? People who have lost hope and no longer think forgiveness is possible for them. These are spiritual casualties. They're drowners. They've drowned in the flooding waters of this world. And that is what this mission is about, that we not number among them. I don't want that. That's why I'm going to all this trouble. But rather that we have the necessary armor to defeat these evil influences, such that we never, folks, we never, dearly beloved, hear those dreaded and fearful and commanding words of his majesty, the king of kings. I do not know you. Go your way. Bind his hands and his feet and cast him into the exterior darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. Neither me do you know, nor my father. I go, and you shall seek me, and you shall die in your sin. Whither I go, you cannot come. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you will do. I do not want any of us ever to hear those words from our king. And that is why this mission has come to your parish. And that is why I want to spend this week reflecting with you on the armor of God that he has graciously given us. If we wear it well, if we use it properly, we will not hear those words. But rather, well done, good and faithful soldier. Come now and enjoy the spoils of your victory. Maybe some of us are not clothed in this armor or have shed parts of it here and there. Look at the examination of conscience. Please come to this mission, read your examination of conscience, and get ready for battle. See for yourselves what has been lost or damaged. Dearly beloved, in the end, there are really only two kinds of people, aren't there? Those who put on the whole armor of God and keep it on until death. And sadly, those who do not. Come and let us confidently don it together by enlisting in the Lord's army during this mission. When Hernan Cortez finally reached Mexico City, the heart of the Aztec Empire, he attempted to negotiate with Montezuma, showing him the cross, showing him Our Lady, and the worship owed to God through the Mass. He was gracious to Montezuma. He did all he could to show him everything that needed to know. He explained to him his idols were devils. After some time of discernment, the Aztec priests came to Montezuma and told him that their idols had spoken. And in no uncertain terms, Our Lady, the cross, the altar, and the daily mass must depart from his realms at once, or there would be war. Cortez, alone at the heart of an empire of evil, greatly outnumbered, probably 10,000 or more to one, boldly and plainly stated in so many words that there would be war and no false peace. He rallied his few men to arms, marching straight on the temple with swords drawn, 
climbing up the pyramid temple and tearing back the veils, concealing the disgusting and cruel idols. He cried, O oh God, why dost thou permit the devil to be so grossly honored in this land? Bowing his head, he added, Accept, O oh Lord, that we may serve thee in this land. Rising up in righteous anger, he immediately grasped a nearby iron bar, struck the idols on the head, breaking their masks, saying, we must risk something for God. The idols were removed later that day. The temple was whitewashed. Heavenly images were erected. The holy masses were offered. The rest is history. Even though he had to retreat, they won. And Mexico became Catholic. The Aztecs, numerous, organized, and skilled as they were, lost the war. Can we not see those same words echoing down through the ages for all soldiers to hear? We must risk something for God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen.